uh, oh wow, they, we have an ad break on there. That is cool as hell. So now we come up and there's, there's an ad. I think it's a uh, is a Taco Bell. It's Taco. There's a Taco Bell ad streaming on there, right after I hit like start, um, and it's like fifteen thirty seconds. That is cool as hell. I I, I don't I don't. I don't know if I'm going to see any any uh, money off of this Taco Bell ad, but it would be kind of cool because um, I'd rather have money from Taco Bell than like any other product. Um, but, you know, that's just me because I detest Taco Bell. But anyways, welcome to Solid State. My name is Tim Banks. Uh, I am here to have this show on behalf of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and since it is a CNCF function, we do have a code of conduct we go by, and I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with what codes of conduct are, and it's be probably, you know, let's not run afoul of it unless you be uh, thrown off the show or beaten up. Uh, with me, I have my dear, dear friend, Ashley Willis, formerly Ashley McNamara, developer relations and engineer extraordinaire. So good, good morning to you, Ashley. Good morning, Tim. I know Ashley, uh, uh, recent uh, mother again of a of a beautiful, beautiful little girl. Got what three hours contiguous of sleep? No, not even <laughs> three hours uh, continuous. No, yeah, total maybe. Yeah, total, total. total. So, um, no, I uh, uh, Ashley and I go way back. Uh, I'm not going to read. Her official bio, because she's it's long. She's done a lot of stuff. She's pretty awesome. Uh, but Ash and I go back to to Object Rocket days, um, slaving away in in downtown Austin, um, in just uh, you know at a, an acquired startup, um, and it has been just an absolute pleasure to watch how far she has gone from those days, I guess about what, seven years ago now, seven. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. second so, office though was dope. No, no. Yeah. That was, Oh gosh. So, so just so everyone knows, like just a little history. So when we were first, um, when we were first, uh, at, uh, in downtown, we were at a building called 300 West six was on Sixth street in Austin. And that building, um, was being slowly taken over by Facebook. Um, and then Facebook paid us. I think they bought our lease out plus extra uh, at a rate so high that we are our next office was in the 19th floor, the entire 19th floor of the Frost Building, which was at the time the most real expensive office real estate in the city of Austin and possibly the state of Texas. Um, and that was a dope. We got murals, we got signs, we got it was just. It was fantastic free parking and we were just just clowning. I mean, we were just stunting on everybody in that place. And um I loved it because we were owned by Rackspace. And so uh, the other Austin Rackspace facility basically is um was terrible. It was awful and nobody liked yeah, it. I was like moldy. <laughs> yeah, it smelled bad. Um there was a lot of stuff going on there that was like, you know, hey, we need security to escort us to our cars and everything like that. But so everyone tried to come to the Frost Building, and it was, um, yeah, we were we were exclusive. The parking was nice for events. Oh yeah, like yeah, just we got rolling on a Saturday. <laughs> oh gosh, it was so nice. It was so nice. Well, I, I, I that was that was the 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 fringe benefit that we that was really overlooked because that was I probably saved thousands of dollars in parking <laughs> by, for, sure, by for sure yeah but um so i would i would like ashley for you to tell me because you you've got two really awesome stories that kind of combined into one first of all you come from a non-traditional quote-unquote tech background right mm -hmm. into tech and then you also come from like you've got three wonderful children and i think Kylie, the first one uh, was born when you were seventeen, yeah, ish. You know, not to not to give away your age. You know, Maybe Kylie's after only twelve. I was seventeen. Yeah, yeah. Kylie's only twelve years old. So uh, you know, it's just <laughs> I did the math right on that one, right? That's twenty nine, right? Twenty nine. So um, no, um, and so you know, there, uh, uh, and I'm I'm bringing this up only because there's been uh, a lot of toss around with the with the abortion restrictions in the state of Texas. 
Um, you know, there's been a narrative going around that like, you know, teen pregnancy is like disastrous life and anything and you never go out to anything after that, which um, I've seen enough in my life to know that that's, that's not the case. Um, but I do think it's important to talk about these stories. And, and there, there are a few other folks I know who have, who have been teen mothers and have not only survived, but thrive, but I, I really want Ashley to tell a story because it's, it's pretty awesome because, you know, set of circumstances around that and then moving from a non-traditional tech background in a tech. So if you could give me like, give me, give me a Twitter thread on that, if you could. Uh, Twitter thread. Um, I'm working on three hours of sleep. So uh, if you could shoot questions at me during this, that would be helpful to help jog my memory. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I guess the, yeah. Let's let's go with um, kind of what was your, if you can remember, like what was your initial kind of like, what were people telling you like uh, when, when you're like, hey, I'm pregnant and they were like, oh gosh, and you know, this and this and this, like kind of what was that reaction and what was your initial feeling about what your future was going to be like? Um, I remember distinctly having a history teacher. So um, for those that don't know, my daughter is half Turkish, born in Turkey, so she's a dual citizen as well. Um, and I remember my history teacher keeping me after class once and saying, Hey, you know what? Like, I, I feel obligated to have a conversation with you. Have you considered adoption? And I was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to keep her. And he was like, I just think it's going to be a really hard life for you. There are people out there who can't have babies and would love to be able to raise your baby and give your baby a better life. And I remember going home and telling my parents about it. My parents were like, nah, like, fuck that guy. Um, oh, hopefully I didn't break the code of conduct there. Um, but I remember thinking about it for a long time, like, wow, like I could have given her up for adoption and she could have had uh, possibly a, a better life. I remember thinking about that for a long time. And I still remember it today. I would say that... Uh, I was in a school of 200 kids from kindergarten to high school. So I, that school had been around for 50, 60 years, something like that. I was the only pregnant person in the history of that high school. So I was also kind of like an outcast in a sense. I remember like kids not talking to me. I remember feeling super lonely around that time. Um, and then when I moved back to the States, there were lots of teen moms. And so it was interesting to come back to the States and have that dynamic as well, where I'm trying to give advice to other teen moms. Um, but then not feeling like that was my crowd either. So where were you kind of feeling like, as I imagine, yeah, it's, it's tough coming back to the States and having that kind of culture shock initially, but also being around other teen moms and you said you, that didn't really feel like your crowd. What was, what do you think set you apart? I don't know. I think I wanted to, because I had her so young, I wanted to also grow up. So it wasn't until I had Topher that I felt like I was a regular mom. Okay. I remember taking Kylie to kindergarten and uh, they said, Oh, you're so young. Oh, you're so young. Like I have experienced exactly the same as you. Like, we're both dropping our kids off at kindergarten. You're not somehow better than me, more experienced than me because you're you know, 29. So it, it was, it's always been interesting because I've never felt like I've been able to connect with moms my own age or obviously older moms until I was, until I had Topher. No, I, I think that's interesting. I had a, what I, I think, 10 year gap between my, you know, my, my oldest and uh, my 13 year old. And I, it, for me, it felt really like, Oh, like, like, yeah, it, that kind of like, I mean, I, you know, I had, I had kids young, not, not at seas, but, but very early twenties. And then, you know, I had my last child when I was 42, right? 41, sorry. And so it feels completely different. It um, does having that, having that child, you know, when you're young 
And not that you know better or anything like that. It's like not not that life experience makes you more prepared for childhood, for, for parenthood, because I don't really think it does to a lot of extent. Um, just having kids makes you more prepared for parenthood because no parent knows what they're doing when they have the first kid. I don't care how old you no, are. No, not, not at all. And I had my last one at 40. So I'd say that they're equally as hard, but for different reasons. Like she was, she was falling yesterday and I like dove to catch her and my body still hurts. Yeah. Like I woke up this yeah. morning, like a truck hit me. I could have done that, you know, at 17, real easy. <laughs> Well, I mean, the the thing for me is that is at forty one. Like, I can do the I can do do the calculus in my head. Is like, what is she falling on? How far is she falling? Oh, she'll be fine. Let her fall. Blop. You know. Whereas, you know, my twenties, uh, yeah, I'm making that I'm making that you know that diving catch, and I'm like, now it's like, ah, uh, you know, I cut myself. I'm looking. Oh, it doesn't need stitches. It'll be fine. Just go wash it off, and you know, just put some super um, glue on it. Yeah, right. So so I think that the the parental experience more than anything helps. But I do think you are right. Like that whole thing. It's like you see somebody who's 29, 30, you know, I've got friends who are having their first kids deep first kids deep in their forties. And you know, they'll be dropping that kid off for kindergarten when they're almost fifty, and they're gonna be yeah. bumping up against somebody who's in their, you know, early to mid twenties. And y'all are on the same foot, maybe not financially, like maybe not your stability and you know like like financial stability or like you know what they say where your, your station in life is but certainly as a parent and i i dare say a lot of times parents who uh you know parents who who have to know some financial struggle um you know who people who have to get by are probably far more prepared for that kind of adversity that comes with child uh you know child raising than people who kind of um been just kind of surfing and, and you know being career people all their lives not that it's not that it's not to slam that or not to diss that because that's hard in its own, hard in its own way but it's a different kind of hard it's a different kind of suffering and you know yeah i've i've, I've had i've had kids when i haven't had two nickels to rub together and i've had tick you know kids when i've had like you know you know I, you know i'm not going to take a trip unless it's first class so so the, you know it is different but but certainly i don't think i'm i'm any much better as a parent in one situation than the other. Yeah, no, me either. Um, the financial stability is certainly helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I'm, I'm much different as a parent, for sure. So, you know, you've got you got Kylie, your your young mom, talk to me about what your you know, how did you progress in professional development or education or anything like that? What, how did that go for you and what did that look like? So I, uh, I barely graduated high school. I had to keep a couple jobs uh, to, to pay for diapers. I was lucky that my mom was able to babysit during the day. I didn't have to pay for a babysitter or daycare until she was in kindergarten, um, but holding down a job and not feeling like I had a choice. Um, plus school was hard for me. Um, I'm also like 80, 80, ADD. So, uh, I learned the things that I want to learn and really dive in. But if somebody says like, all right, you have, you have to go learn this. Like, do I, do I really? <laughs> and so, so I, I had a photography for career for a really long time. I dove into that. I don't know what the saying, what's the saying um, about doing something you love and it's not a job, right? What's the saying, Tim? Oh, it's like, you know, find a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life, which is yeah. utter, utter bullshit. It's crap. Uh, so I did that <laughs> for about 10 years, um, hated it, uh, but it, it was my sort of entry into tech. It turns out photographers at the time uh, were mostly just, you know, moms with a camera. And so they didn't know how to run a business, how to build a website, how to build a blog, how to make sure that um, either one of those things ranked on Google. Um, so I was selling those services. They also didn't know how to process an image. So I was selling Photoshop actions and presets and uh, 
it turns out that photographers were my target market instead of actual like going out and finding clients. So that was my entry into tech. Uh, again, working on three hours of sleep here. Um, and I was lucky enough to find OpenStack and open source really early. I liked the vibe of those communities. And because I decided that I wasn't going to go get a CS degree, I just didn't have the time. Um, I had two young kids at the time. Uh, so I went to a boot camp. And before I went to the boot camp, I was actually hired at Object Rocket. So I went, they, they said, we'll let you start late. Go to your silly little boot camp and then, you know, start here. So I did that. And then I started at Object Rocket. It's kind of history after that. And so, yeah, that's where, that's where we met. And I, I, think it was interesting because you went right into you know um developer relations and community management um early very very early that wasn't and the plan. <laughs> and the thing that i remember about it the most uh in seeing is that that you were i mean you were learning tech you were very very savvy as far as when it came to graphic design stuff like that but you had brilliant ideas about how to engage people um in in a in a place where, you know, <clears throat> objectively, you know, for 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 the founders of Object Rocket, whom whom I adore, but they weren't always the most. Um, what's what I'm looking for? Like when it comes to engaging people, sometimes they they just kind of um, it just didn't go well. <laughs> uh, and no, I think I think because they were experts. Um you have a different relationship with the community. You expect yeah. them to like fangirl over you and come to you and you're no longer going to them and seeking them. Right. So the relationship yeah. is different. Yeah. And what I thought is that you brought, just brought brilliant ideas into that space um, that were, that we absolutely benefited from because you did not come from, like a kind of standard tech background, you had a completely different perspective, right? And it was important and it made a huge difference, right? Um, in how people were engaged and how we reached out and how we um, how we kind of um, embraced the, the community, right? Um, even how we just talked to our customers or how we, um, how we engaged with them, how we, you know, hey, let's go do this thing for them and they're all gonna love it. And I'm like, wow, they really did love that. And, and, less expensive than it would have been like because of those ideas that you had that came from like i said from a different perspective and so i think that's one of the things when we have the inevitable discussion that we have every whatever the cycle is about what is devrel is devrel important you know what are non-traditional backgrounds mean and things like that is that people bring different perspectives on how to engage with people and what's important to talk about when people engage or what's important to listen to when people engage that um, that is essential in getting diverse perspectives on how your product is used or how to build your product for other people. Because um, it is, I think that the, that's one of the things that really taught me the importance of listening to people uh, when they speak, especially if they're not a quote unquote expert on that field because a lot of the people that are going to use your product are not the quote unquote expert in that field. Right. Um, right. because they were, they'd probably be working for us, not, not per consuming our, our services. Um, and how to make those things usable for people who aren't the quote unquote experts in the field, because yeah, like, like I, I, you, if, if the barrier for using your product, is that you have to be an expert. No one's going to ever use anything. Like we're going to have three people use anything. It's going to be like, it'll be like selling Arch Linux, you know, like it's just not. Well, I, I think, I think when people are you know, writing blog posts or documentation or um, any sort of technical content, they're trying to prove how smart they are. Right. I like, I still struggle at, at object rocket, trying to get people to write blog posts um, that were, easy for anyone to understand because everyone was like, I'm an expert. I could prove that I'm an expert. If I write one-on-one content, people won't respect me. 
So selling the idea that explain it like I'm five content uh, is just as valuable as as the other as the other stuff was was sometimes hard. And we had a small team at at Object Rocket as well. So I think. I think sometimes I, I struggled and that wasn't the job I was supposed to have when I started. I, I ended up with that job because somebody quit and they were like, hey, you like to go to meetups, right? Do you want this job? Oh, and it comes with a, a, a small team. I had like one person under me at the time. Yeah. Yeah. You had exactly one. Wasn't that that wasn't that Laura? Laura Jane? Mm -hmm. No, oh, I had two. I had Laura and I had Nikki. You remember? Oh, that's right, Nikki. Nikki, yeah. Um, and so, what now? What was your original role you got hired for? Uh, I can't even remember because I didn't even get this started. I had like, she quit three weeks after I started, so I can't even remember. I just remember it was not well paid. So. So you went from small team at a, you know, an object rocket. Mm -hmm. How did you go from, um, how did you go from that? All right. Give, give me that, what that leapfrog looked like career wise from your first, would you say your first quote unquote tech role was, was that a role at object rocket to yeah. what you're doing now? It's hard to, it's not even hard to say. It's, it's easy, I guess. I remember I was sort of sick of, of Object Rocket after, after the founders left, uh, it just wasn't the same anymore. Right. So I remember like we had lots of conversations about this, uh, in that 19th floor kitchen. Um, I was interviewing, I think I interviewed with, with Heptio. That was a missed opportunity. Sorry, Kevin. Um, I also interviewed with, I can't even remember. I interviewed with a couple of people and I was sort of down to Heptio and Pivotal. And my friend Andrew Clay Schaefer ran a, a, uh, a team at Pivotal. Bridget was on it. And I was like, oh man, it'd be really cool to work with Bridget. And he's like, yeah, come on, come on over here. Like, we'll pay you well. Um, you'll love it. Uh, you'll get to do relatively the same things that you're doing now, just, you know, without a team. And I was like, oh, it would be nice to not have a team anymore. It'd be nice to kind of be an IC again. So Pivotal ended up hiring me uh, 10 weeks into that job. Microsoft came knocking and they were like, hey, you want to come work over here? And I was like, mm, I don't know. I work with open source communities. That doesn't sound smart for me. And they were like, no, no, no. It's like, we've changed. And I was like, okay, prove it. So I went into that interview, kind of like, kind of cocky about it. Like, oh yeah, prove it. And so <laughs> uh, they ended up doing that. And about a couple of months into the Microsoft job, I ended up with an open source team. And now I run all the language teams, plus the cloud native team and the Linux team. It's around 37 people at this point. That's not, please tell me that's not 37 directs. No. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go beat somebody from Microsoft for that. If that's the case. No, it's um, eight directs. Okay. Very, very much better. Now, what I think was interesting was around that time, is like as you got in, people started noting that, again, that you did contributions to the community that had nothing to do with coding. Like, um, I seem to remember a gopher or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and other kind of cool little things that you added to the community that had nothing to do with code that made the community much, much like, like think about it, like who remembered, like we all, I'm pretty sure have seen the go gophers, like in, in the various creations you've made or anything like that. And they're like, oh, well, no, those are so cool. But it's like, no one thinks about like the notion behind creating this or, or like, why would you do that? Or is it a line of code? Is it this feature? Is that feature? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Those things are important too, but having that thing that sticks in your mind, like something as simple as a mascot or a logo 
or a, just a, a, a cute thing to remind you uh, or represent the community you, you belong to or contribute to, um, that's important. And those are things that, again, if you're not, if you're just a traditional kind of like CS grant, things like that, you're probably not going to think about it that way. You're probably not going to maybe even be able to, to create the things like that or um, give them the vibrance and add them, add the right thing at the right time like you have. And I think that's super important. Like um, I remember like, just seeing that and I was like, that is cool as hell. And everyone, everyone loves Ashley McNamara because she's brilliant, smart, and talented because you are right. But letting people see that in a way that has nothing to do with the number of uh, commits you've made to GitHub or how many CVEs you've done or whatever the other arbitrary metrics we have to try and measure people's contributions. Um, and seeing that for me and seeing this, you know, as the kids say, this glow up, uh, that you've had and have people give you the chance to be great and to have you see you seize that chance and really uh you know just really excel at it has just been amazing as your as your as a person in the industry and as your friend it's been amazing to watch right um and, you know just i'm back here like you know you know and and, and to full disclosure ash and i have you know have had many, she's had many conversations in that 19th floor kitchen over text, over whatever, just about what's going on um, in each other's lives. And and it's just been um, really amazing to see. And, and what I think that the important thing that I have seen and that I've benefited from, and I think that I'd like maybe you to touch on is like, um, talk about some of the, like you, you talked about, somebody gave you an opportunity to do this thing, right? What were your concerns or apprehensions about op the opportunities and like kind of what drove you to to capitalize on that? And and then and then like to pay it forward, like now you're in a place, how are you giving other folks those opportunities? Yeah, so I think the thing about me is I've never had an ego about the things I know or don't know. Um, I've always contributed where I think I can contribute. If it's docs, if it's code, if it's design, whatever it is, whatever people need, I don't need to be the smartest person in the room. And in fact, I'd rather not be the smartest person in the room. Um, I think like the latest, uh, the latest team change that we had was I, I now have all of the language teams under me. Um, that is an amazing opportunity. I know language communities, um, but I don't know JavaScript. I have a JavaScript team under me. They are a very high performing team. Um, that was an opportunity um, for me, but I have to lean on those experts in, in that team. I have to lean on that team lead. I can help drive strategy, but for technical decisions moving forward, that team lead is, is the one that I'm going to trust to make those decisions and I will back up those decisions. So I try not to, to pretend I know what I'm doing uh, because if I do, that team is gonna fail. So I have to be very clear about the things that I don't know and accept that, be okay with that and learn with them um, but know who the expert in the room is. And sometimes it's not me and that's okay. And I think that in tech, uh, we're so eager to, to pretend we know more than we do. Um, especially if we have a large following on Twitter, um, and that sucks, but, but I get the pressure, you know, and then you ask how I pay it forward. I'm very passionate about people who are just starting. Um, I know how hard it was for me. I think if I would have had different mentors or different advice, I would not have, you know, given that boot camp twenty thousand dollars. I didn't have, you know. So uh, the latest thing I did was my nanny is a CS student. She's nannying for us during the summer, and she goes back to school soon. Um, she's nineteen years old. She knows Java. She's brilliant. She's smart. Um, so I, I tweeted like, hey, who, who has internships available for second year students? And now she's got a thousand followers on Twitter um, and lots of opportunities. I think that that's the least I could do with the following that I have is 
help give people opportunities, especially people who are just starting out. Um, like she has a traditional experience with, you know, she's going through University of Washington, getting her CS degree, that's traditional, but she still needs help, especially after school. Yeah, one of the thing the the thing that I still contribute or think not contribute the thing I still send to people is that you created a um, like kind of like a guide or a, um, a compilation of resources for folks out there trying to learn things on their own, um, and it's it's on your it's on your GitHub page, yeah. um, and which I think is brilliant. Um, and it's, it's awesome that you do that. Um, if you haven't seen it, we'll, we'll, I'll post that up, make sure people see it because I do think you, you said it's like you haven't updated in a while and it's, you know, sure we can, we can keep that curated, but you've done a massive amount of work to, to have that there. Um, and it's helped a lot of people out. Um, the other thing that I saw, the other thing that I really loved that you did, um, I guess was about a year and a half ago to you, it might've been just before the pandemic. I don't remember, but you, you just step back and it's like, you know what, I'm not going to do, don't, don't contact me for talks, right? Here, you know, contact a, a person of color or, or someone like that, and more people who are more marginalized communities, please go ask them to, to talk, right? Um, which I think is fantastic. I mean, not not that we don't need more women to, to talk and more, nor, you know, more women to, represent, to, be, to be represented uh, in talks and in panels and things like that. But um, for you to say like, yeah, I mean, like I'm a woman, but also, you know, benefit from being white, and I want more people who are marginalized to be able to to have a voice uh, and to be seen and represented. I think was was really awesome, especially when you are in a field that you kind of like you're you're gated on how many talks you give or how many things you write or um, things like that. For you to say like, no, I want other people to have those opportunities. Like that's important. Like for me, uh, as a man of color, to say like, okay, you know, you see me right and you understand what we're going through. Um, where do you think the industry stands on having that kind of representative, especially in, in dev rail, dev advocacy and, and those who are, you know, standing up and talking about the tech that, that, that people use. So I did that because I noticed that I kept seeing the same people on stage. I already have a platform. I can speak into the void on Twitter and people are going to listen. Um, I, I don't need more. It, I'm not benefiting anymore by doing another talk. So I wanted to see different faces, faces I had not seen. I knew people wanted to be on stage. You can see it. Uh, people tweet about it. So when I decided to step back, because I wanted to see different people, um, I wanted to help other people build their, their platform. I do benefit from my platform a lot, but again, I have one already. So, uh, what was the second part of your question, Tim? Um, Ashley, you know, just like you, I am horrendously ADHD and I don't remember what the second half of my question was. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, like, uh, it was, it was, um, where do we stand on the on there? And uh, what do you? Well, how about this? What do you think we still can do? Like, what are some? What are the? What are some like the low hanging fruits you think that we can do um, in the industry when it comes to, especially like during, you know, virtual talks and whatever, to to get more representation and in, in, in conferences and talks and other methods of engagement. The lowest hanging fruit is to if you have any size platform at all, and somebody asks you to speak at their conference. If the lineup is not diverse, you refuse to participate. So like, that's just bare minimum, right? So, and I think that, that conferences, conference organizers, while they have the best of intentions sometimes, um, don't always execute in that way, right? Like they're trying to optimize for it. Like they want people to come to their conference. They want people to buy tickets. They want the lineup to be something that they know is gonna be good, right? And you have to, sometimes you have to gamble, right? So I know that this person, I've never seen them speak before, but the topic is interesting. 
they know what they're talking about, you can see in the abstract, give them the platform, just give it to them. So I think it's hard. I, I imagine it's hard as a conference organizer to make those decisions, uh, but we have to force them to by not allowing them uh, our time if the lineup is not diverse. Yeah, I think one of the, you know, one of the things that I, I railed, about, railed about in the in the before times was that, you know, we have these conferences and, you know, not only are the are the panels not not very diverse, but we have these conferences in the most expensive real estate in the world, um, you know, at times where it's, diff you know, especially during, you know, the school year or whatever, um, you have them during the week. You have them in very expensive places. You cost thousands of dollars. The hotels cost thousands of dollars, and the plane tickets cost thousands of dollars. And you make it it's as exclusive as possible yeah. for people to be able to come, right? If you are a college student, you don't have a lot of money. It's gonna be hard for you to come. If you are a single parent, right, and you have to find someone to take care of your kids while you're there, it's gonna be really hard for you to come. If you just don't have a lot of money and you're junior or you're trying to break in, and these conferences are ex really, really good networking opportunities or opportunities to learn or opportunities to advance your career, you can't come if you don't have that money to invest. And so just by default, you're going to have people who are well-to-do or long in the toothy industry, and that's going to not be a very diverse group. Um, and I get that for community conferences, maybe where no one's making a profit on it and sure it's hard to, you know, to get the resources to do that. But if you're at like reInvent or if you're like at Cisco or Microsoft Conf one of these conferences where these companies that are worth in the trillions of dollars or print money, you can probably afford to either have free conferences or have some grants or scholarships or sliding scale kind of stuff. Um, or make it donation based or whatever, right? You know, charge it, charge, charge your vendors, you know, <laughs> because they're the ones making money off it. But certainly, folks who are trying to come and just, you know, capitalize on opportunity for their careers, maybe we don't charge them. Um, and I've seen more people do that during virtual conferences because the overhead is a lot lower. But, you know, going forward as we go, you know, back into whatever the normal looks like after this, um, you know, do we go back to that model where it's, really expensive or really exclusionary or do we try to do better um i don't know it's I'm, I'm not a conference organizer either it's easy for me to sit back here in my chair behind this keyboard and say well you should do this you should do this you should do this i don't know so if you're a conference organizer and i'm wrong you want to tell me to get bent please please no like like seriously no 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 tino shade please at me on twitter right because i would love to have that conversation and figure out what we can do um i will pick on matt stratton um for DevOps days because number one, I like to pick on Matt Stratton because he's 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 just a big soft, you know, I love him to death. Um, but also, you know, he's really, really open to being held accountable for things. And I've come at him and it's like, y'all should do this and y'all should do this and y'all should do this. This is very this is this is very low effort for you to do um to try and make things more exclusionary. I mean not exclusionary, try and make things less exclusionary and more inclusive. I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, we we're gonna we can we can try and do that. Um, which I think is important. So um Aside from all, all that, right, I know that we're now going into fall, right? And as I understand, you are the most basic of white women. Have you had your first pumpkin spice latte yet? Tim, I don't know how many times I need to tell you this. You do not drink the PSLs. <laughs> but you know I'm going to ask you that every year. Every year, every year, I know. And not just once, but multiple times. So multiple times, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you do. I have seen you wear the Han Solo outfit, though. Have, have I? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, no, one hundred percent. There's pictures for sure. Yeah. Uh oh. Okay, thank you. I'm like, this is live. <laughs> so that's the that's the four year old. That's, mm -hmm. that's like having your own grandkid. Um, No, really, like I'm shooting something live. Can you not? That's a 13 year old. There's no excuse for that. I don't know why he literally <laughs> just walked in here with a bag of charcoal. Like, like I need charcoal in my office. You might. You <laughs> might. Uh, welcome to live streaming, ladies and gentlemen. 
and other folks that are not ladies or gentlemen. Um, so Ashley, let me, let me ask you this. All right. So we're both, we're both on the bird site. Um, and, uh, you know, we're both somewhat active, right? Uh, if you could, and this is completely off the cuff, but I just want to hear this. If you could, if you could wave a wand and do one thing to make, make Twitter a better place, what would you do? Um, and you can't close the site down. See, you know, a better place. Um, Good question, Tim. There's so much. I don't know if I'm having a hard time narrowing it down or I feel like <laughs> um oh, no. I, I can think of a lot of things. Some are not safe for work. Um <laughs> So I think somebody should, re I think there should be a review committee for any anonymous photos sent to, sent to women. Um, I think, uh, I, I don't know, we could go back and forth on an edit button. I, I'm, I, I've been sold either way. Uh, I don't know, Tim, what would you do? I would moderate all replies from an account that is less than 45 days old. Oh, see, that's good. That's good. That's good. Maybe not allow you to tweet until you have a, a, at least a picture and, uh, you know, some sort of content available. Here's the other thing I would do. This is actually really, and I, and, I, and I wish they could send me to do this for fun too, but I would make it, I would make verification super, super simple, unlike they do now, where as long as you have, like, like you know how you verify yourself for uh, Keybase? Yeah. Like, if you could use that process to verify, verify yourself on Twitter so that the vast majority of legitimate Twitter users can be verified, right? It has to map back to a person, like a verified person, and then filter replies, responses, comments, or views, or anything like that to only verified accounts. Yeah, that's that's the only good feature about, about verified is that I can filter for verified accounts, and that is nice. But the pool is so small, there's not a lot. Yeah, there. I, I am ineligible to be verified. Um, Why? Because... Uh, because I don't, I don't have enough followers or I'm not a news, like I'm not newsy enough. I'm not an organization. Uh, I'm not a professional athlete. Um, oh, yeah, I'm not yeah, an athlete. the new criteria. Yeah. 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 And I didn't, I didn't get in. I wasn't wide enough just to get in to be like verified with, you know, an account, a two month old account with 30 followers. So yeah, yeah. That, that happens. I've seen that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did, and there's something about the people that that happened to that I can't quite figure out um, about it, but you know, it, it is what it is. But yeah, that's the change I would make. Uh, honestly, that's probably, I think that would make a big, th big, the biggest change. Yeah. No, you know, make verification easy so that, you know, it maps back to a person, you know, profile picture and all that kind of stuff like that. Uh, and then allow yourself to only be viewed by comments and replies from, and, and DMs only from verified accounts nice i do like the new feature where you can uh you can select who can reply to your posts and now one. you can do it retroactively which is great yeah that's nice too yeah but uh but yeah i think because there's there's a lot of bad things about the bird site right but i do think and i will say for me at least especially during the pandemic the ability to reach out to people and talk to people all across the the globe whenever that are within a, a circle right has been literally a lifesaver you know in a lot of cases where it's just like hey you know someone can respond back i've met like real friends like you know people that are really really Absolutely. awesome on there um and it's just that it also like there's that that's great and then it also sucks at the same time but yeah I, you know, I noticed like, that when i stopped having hard opinions on twitter um the experience was much better for better for worse <laughs> yeah and and i don't know 
that I don't want I don't want to give up hard opinions. You shouldn't have to give up hard opinions. You should be able to but but it does make it easier, right? If you just yeah. if you just have soft opinions and thirst traps make you super, super popular. Well, it's it's interesting. So, you know, my nanny just joined and right now it's amazing and it's helpful and everyone wants to show off what they know, right? Like, oh I'm gonna teach you something, I'm gonna help you. But then, you know, my good friend Sarah Drasner her mentions are a dumpster fire and it's because she knows what she's doing. She knows what she's talking about and she's an expert. She tweets about tech and everyone just wants to argue with her and tell her she's wrong. Right? So it's interesting how the, the, the dynamic between the two accounts and uh, I've already warned uh, Nancy about this, like, Hey, as you, become more confident and you start tweeting the things that you know, the same people who are there to, to rescue you and teach you will be the same people to well actually you later. Yeah, it's the it's the competition to be the smartest person in the room. It's, it goes back to what you said before, like, you know, the the best people I've ever worked with are don't have those egos. They do not think like, yeah, I have to be the smartest, number one, the the most, you know, alpha geek. Um, in the, in the teams that I've enjoyed working on the most where everyone, you know, Hey, I know about this and I can talk to this, but I don't know about this, but this person does know about this. And, and you go to that kind of like very, very, um, it, it is, it's team centric. It's like, I, I, you know, I specialize in this is like, you know, playing, it's like playing team fortress back in the day. Somebody has really good heavy weapons. There, that's great, but they're not a good sniper. Can't snipe, you know, can you snipe with the, with the Gatling gun? Maybe, but you should. It's not a great idea. It's, yep. Yeah. I, 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 that is the first time I've ever busted out a gaming reference in like forever because I'm not a gamer anymore, but I still get it. Everyone's got a role to play. Everyone has a role to play. I'm not a gamer anymore. It's not like more than four buttons on a controller. I'm, I'm out. I'm out now. Yeah. I gave it up when I think after I had crossed like the $30,000 threshold and how much I had invested in a computer for gaming i was like this is dumb and i bought a console and i stopped gaming well <laughs> like every now and then i play a couple games but i don't have the time i certainly don't have the money and i just don't have the patience anymore to be into it like i used to be into it where i'm like you know clan practice and clan matches and you know all that kind of stuff and getting the fastest yeah. video cards yeah but i mean, leave that to toe for now more power to you if you do. Like, I'm not going to name no names, but I know people that still do that. And they, I'm like, hey, man, that's awesome. I'm good. I can't do that anymore. I'm, you know, I'm just old. And I'm not as rich as I should be. <laughs> so, all right, we've got a little bit of time left. I need you to tell me, Ashley, how's Lindsay doing? Lindsay's great. Uh, and he, he's working at a startup. Um, He's still buying silly cars. I was going to ask, did so I, I saw the fact that he got rid of the, the, the Supra mm -hmm. and he got a minivan. And, yeah, that's right. The minivan is dope. I don't you know, hear any nonsense about you know, the minivan. You know, choices, choices were made. The minivan that, is dope. Did he, did he get anything else since the minivan? Uh, he's got a BMW coming. A BMW what? You're gonna have to tweet at him and ask him. I don't know anything about cars. I know it's a BMW. I know a friend is going to pick it up from Denver and drive it here. Um, that's all I know. I know, you know that I won't be embarrassed to sit in it, is what he said. Well, I mean, look, if you're gonna not be embarrassed to sit in a minivan, you literally can't be embarrassed to sit in anything else, right? I mean, it's debatable if you haven't been in a minivan, it's amazing. I, I've, I've been in minivans. No, you've not been in my minivan. You've not been in the Kia Honorable Tim. It's incredible. Go ahead. I see it. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I am unbothered. Yeah, just 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 for the full disclosure, um, Ashley has two children, and you know that are young enough to be under her care. I have four children that are under my care, and I swore off swore off minivans forever. Choices. Yeah, everyone, everyone makes their own choices. They're good for her. I just can't. I just can't do it. I, I was, I was, 
<laughs> I was more, I wasn't, I wasn't sad for Ashley. I was sad for Lindsay because I know Lindsay's a car guy. Like I am super into cars. Yeah. Like I remember <laughs> two weeks after we got it, we're like leaving a, a target and he's like, took, he didn't take the corner <laughs> as well as he should have and like curbed it. And he was like, yeah, I can't even like pretend to care about it. He just he just banging it against stuff, you know, leaving the windows open when he goes to the car wash or whatever. Does not, not does not care. Not folding so, yours. Yeah. So yeah, he did get he did get rid of the Supra. For the record, I did not tell him to get rid of the Supra. But you know, he's like he he's a big dude and he likes tiny cars and he had back surgery, so it's just it's not yeah. it's like not I, I can't well. I can't talk but so much because I got rid of my, you know, uh Infinity Red Sport uh, 400 for a Dodge Durango GT. Like, so I, I had choices too, but at least, at least it wasn't me, man. But he, he's coming back. He'll get the BMW. I, I don't know when, at some point. I know it's not yeah. new, but it's not old enough to gross me out. It hasn't been through enough frat boys' hands yet. Ugh. So, um, Ashley, what's next for you? I don't know, Tim leading a bunch of language communities at, at Microsoft. Any, but any, any big projects coming up, anything that you want to. There, there is not a single thing I'd like to plug at this point. Um, okay. I, I'm working on three hours of sleep and at, at, at this stage, um, I'm just trying to make it day by day. You know what I mean? Yeah, until 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 uh, little Marlo sleeps all the way through the night. Yeah, she's one in a couple of days, so uh, any day would be great. Has it been that long? Yeah, she's one. Gosh, we're, gosh we are getting ancient. Mm -hmm. Me more so than you, obviously, but still. Obviously, yeah. 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 Well, Ashley, it has been wonderful to catch up with you on camera, at least. And I am super stoked that you could come on here. Thank you for telling your story. Um, where can people find you? At Ashley McNamara on Twitter. Okay. And like I said, I'll post up that, um, I will post up the link to your GitHub repository. Learn to code repo. Yeah, 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 Learn to Code Repo. Um, please help update that. Keep keep it up to date if you want to. Um, yes. It is GitHub. It would be great. Yeah. Um, and I will continue to, 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 uh, advocate and support you, my friend, uh, because you are doing awesome things and I cannot wait to see what you do next. So, um, I am Tim Banks and this has been solid state. Thank y'all. <laughs>